China's rise, beginning with market reforms in the 1980s, is arguably the most significant rupture in the 21st century. It has shifted the balance of power from the West to the East, reshaped economic relations around the world, challenged long-held assumptions that economic growth cannot be achieved without Western democracy. Yet China's rise is not a golden age of only prosperity and progress. Its spectacular growth has come with many problems, not least rising inequality, endemic corruption, financial bubbles, and environmental degradation. The coexistence of growth and problems has produced two extreme narratives in popular media. Either China is rising inexorably and taking over the world, or facing numerous threats and about to collapse. One narrative is fearful, and the other is gleeful. But neither is correct. There is a better, more rational, and more humane way of understanding China and its seeming paradoxes. Namely, they're not that unique. Consider this passage. They turn the society rooted in the soil into one based in cities. They lifted the standard of living of ordinary people to a plane associated with aristocracy. Yet for all the advances in material life, there remained a feeling that things had gone wrong, a screw had come loose, and the wheels fallen out of balance. Prosperity was precarious as the crisis revealed, inequality was more obvious than ever. The capitalists controlled the government. You might think this is a description of present-day China. In fact, it is a description of America's Gilded Age, from 1865 to 1900, by the historian H.W. Brands. Crucially, gilded does not mean golden. It implies that beneath the dazzling appearance of gold lies a base dark metal. That's why the novelists Mark Twain and Charles Warner seized on this metaphor to capture America's rise as an emerging superpower at the turn of the last century. In America, access did not lead to boom, but rather rebirth. Public backlash against unbridled capitalism sparked mass protests, social movements, media exposés against corruption, violent clashes between workers and big corporations, and civil service reforms. Reading the news back then, you might conclude America is in decline. But with the benefit of hindsight, we know that the seeming chaos at the time was a groundswell of economic and social reforms that came to be known as the U.S. Progressive Era. That domestic revolution, along with imperial acquisitions abroad, paved the way for America's rise as the superpower of the 20th century. The lens of American history helped us understand the evolution of modern China in a way that's familiar, but importantly, not identical. America and China have different political systems. Obviously, America is a democracy, whereas China is ruled by one party. Thus, as we will see, the two countries respond to the accesses of capitalism very differently. One, by activating civil society, and the other, by tightening political control. As Mark Twain once said, History does not repeat itself, but it often does rhyme. There's a tendency to see China as a static monolith, an authoritarian regime governed by the same ruling party. In reality, since the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, at least three different Chinas have emerged under Mao, Deng, and Xi. Mao ruled for a three-decade period from 1949 to his death in 1976. Under Mao, China was a centrally planned economy 
cut off from the world. Through mass propaganda, Mao engineered a personality cult. During the 10-year Cultural Revolution, he incited fanatic followers to attack government officials and eventually turn against one another. In his scheme to purge moderate politicians whom he saw as his rivals. Mao's personalist dictatorship and the closed command economy inflicted famine, poverty, and mass violence upon the country. After Mao came Deng Xiaoping, who launched Reform and Opening in December of 1978. Interestingly, unlike Mao, Deng was never chairman of the Communist Party. Deng's highest administrative title was vice premier, but crucially, he held the post of the chairman of the Central Military Commission. As Ezra Vogel wrote, in the annals of world political history, it would be difficult to find another case where a person becomes a top leader without formal recognition of the succession. Not only was Deng not given an inauguration, there was not even a public announcement that he had risen to the top position. Yet despite the lack of pomp and celebration, China entered a new, miraculous 30-year chapter under Deng, known as the Reform Era. Politics is the foundation of all economic growth. Thus, Deng's reforms rested on a quiet political revolution, a fundamental shift from Mao's one-man rule to a new model of collective term-limited leadership. On the economy, Deng abandoned key elements of central planning, liberated the private sector, and engaged with the United States. On governance, he made the bureaucracy more decentralized, adaptive, and results-oriented. What Deng never endorsed corruption, he announced that some will get rich first, implying that CCP officials would personally benefit from doing their part to drive GDP growth at all costs. This process of reform was not a smooth, straight line, however. In 1989, China was hit by an existential crisis. Mass protests broke out in Tiananmen Square that erupted in a bloody crackdown. Foreign investors fled the country and the conservative faction had the upper hand. At that juncture, China's market reforms could have been reversed. In 1992, Deng turned the climate around with his famous Southern Tour, a publicity campaign to pump up support for continued market reform. He succeeded, and a new leadership took over, vowing not only to keep markets open, but wider than before. Subsequently, under Deng's successors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, the initially rural orientation of China's market reforms, which massively benefited poor farmers, took a decidedly urban turn as export manufacturing and foreign investment surged. Factories relocated to China. Like in the U.S. Gilded Age, mass industrialization depended on migrants. Except in China, these migrants were domestic. The countryside provided a vast supply of cheap workers who were denied equal access to urban services, thereby keeping labor costs low. Regional, urban, rural, and class inequality grew over time. In 2001, China joined the WTO with support from the United States. From there, its economy soared. At the same time, land and real estate emerged as the favorite source of public revenue and a new growth engine. But the resulting wealth from this sector worsened inequality, creating robber barons like Hui Kaiyan, the founder of the real estate company Evergrande that is now being liquidated. And it enriched speculators, while the majority of Chinese either could not afford housing or paid dearly for it. In other words, the period of China's rise from poverty to middle-income status was achieved specifically during the reform era. 
under the leadership of Deng and his successors. In 1980, measured by current U.S. dollars, China's GDP per capita was equivalent to Malawi's, around $300. By 2012, China's GDP per capita grew 21-fold to more than $6,300, whereas Malawi's merely increased to $560. During this 30-year period, China's feat of lifting some 800 million people out of absolute poverty was achieved through sustained national growth, not poverty relief from the government or foreign aid agencies handing out chickens and cash. But while a rising tide raises all boats, not all boats rise equally. This period of China's rise from poverty was also the making of a Gilded Age. When Xi Jinping took over as the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party in 2012, he inherited the Gilded Age, the first in modern Chinese history. He presides over a country that is far wealthier than the ones ruled by his predecessors. Does Xi relinquish Deng's humble principles in foreign policy of lying low and never showing off? and projected for the first time since 1949 ambitions to become a global leader. At the same time, he must also confront a host of new problems that come with being a middle-income, crony capitalist economy, for which the party has no playbook. Xi sees his historic mission as summoning China out of the Gilded Age using the tools of Leninism, commands and campaigns. I call this a red progressive platform. Red in the sense that his end goal is not only to fight graft and inequality, but also to preserve the party's grip on power, even as China becomes more affluent and globalized. Xi's socially progressive goals coincided with an authoritarian revival, a return to the concentration of personal power seen on the Mao. Xi has dismantled the collective leadership and informal checks on power that Deng put in place. He has tightened political control and reversed much of the limited political liberalizations that occurred in the previous decades, such as investigative journalism. He has also expanded the state sector at the expense of the private one. As soon as he took office, Xi launched his Red Progressive platform, even though he did not call it that. That began with the anti-corruption drive, the longest in the party's history, and his poverty eradication campaign. It pledged to eliminate the last mile of poverty, some 100 million people, through targeted government assistance in the poorest regions. In 2021, his agenda extended to a crackdown on big private tech companies and celebrities who were perceived as decadent. The private tutoring industry blamed for creating unequal access to education was shut down almost overnight by command. But when the regulatory storm in 2021 alarmed investors and wiped out billions in share value, Xi seemed to learn the limits of commands. In a speech later that year, he told an audience of Chinese bureaucrats, on eradicating poverty, we have plenty of experience, but on managing prosperity, we still have much to learn. Future historians should mark this peculiar moment in history. It is the first time a communist party has tried to order away the problems of capitalism after encouraging it to thrive. 2023 marks a new chapter in modern China. Xi began his third term in office and ended three years of pandemic controls. In the past year, China has been struggling with a broad economic slowdown, which is a novel problem for the party that has known poverty 
under communism, and boom under capitalism, but not a post-boom slump. In the coming years, perhaps decades, Xi's big gamble is that it can mobilize the nation to replace an expired growth model with a new one, focused on technology, clean energy, and advanced manufacturing. That gamble remains in progress. To make sense of the present and peer into the future, we must know the past. In the rest of this series, I'll share the politics and process behind China's escape from poverty into a speedy yet risky corrupt mode of growth. The first part of the story, how China escaped the poverty trap, is specifically about the reform era. Under the leadership of Deng and his successors from 1978 to 2012. Know that this is not about Mao's period of communist authoritarianism, nor is it about Xi's post-2012 campaign to eradicate the last mile of poverty through targeted welfare. I emphasize this because I've encountered confusion on both fronts, from individuals who conflate Mao, Deng, and Xi into one unchanging China. One person got upset at my first book, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap, because he thought it was apologizing for Mao's atrocities during communism. Another person quoted passages from the book to justify Xi's authoritarian turn. The first person was confused, whereas the second person wanted to confuse. Whether it's my account or other accounts, be sure you know the time period in question. For an analogy, think of America under Obama versus America under Trump. Same country, same democracy, but profound changes in society and foreign affairs. The second part of the story, China's Gilded Age, turns to the dark sides of heady growth, in particular, corruption and Xi's relentless campaign against corruption since he took over in 2012. Together, I hope they can help you understand how China has come a long way since communism and arrived at its current point, the end of a Gilded Age and the beginning of a still unfolding and uncertain future.